Hey guys, Andy here at MVP Java. Thanks for joining me. Today we're going to be talking about advanced Java logging with Spring Data and MongoDB. So I'm going to be putting a different spin on things here. Um, one of the you know first things you do usually when you're setting up logging is you set up a rolling file appender. It's low-hanging fruit in the sense where it's very easy to set up and off you go, you have logging. Problem is later on when you have a very real problem to investigate, right? Once you open up that file and you're looking at those thousands of lines spread out over perhaps multiple files, you quickly realize that you know manually searching through uh, something might not be the best approach. So you go on the command line and you start pulling your greps. And then next thing you know, you're piping to another grep, piping to another grep. And now you kind of see that you know you can't do those time range checks or figure out you know a certain thread what did a certain thread log within a specific time range what kind of error did it log and extract this you know the stack trace associated with that exception it just isn't possible on the command line to do that anymore so you're gonna have to write your own script and that it just opens up pandora's box okay so we're gonna try to address that in this uh, tutorial over here so why mongodb well mongodb is a perfect fit for this kind of scenario where we're writing once and reading many times okay Mongo really excels in that area. So we're writing our log record once, we're not updating it afterwards, and we're reading it many times because we're gonna be performing some really nice queries on it later on, okay? The other thing is, is with the collection that we're gonna set up in this tutorial, I'll show you how to achieve that same behavior of the rolling file appender, which means that I'm gonna be creating a capped collection. A capped collection basically is, is just that. It has a maximum size, and once it's reached, it'll roll over and start writing out the oldest data, okay? So much like a rolling file appender. So I'll show you how to do that. Now, this is not a MongoDB tutorial, so I've already set mine up. I'll show you the capped commands uh, that, that are out there. But, um, you know, I invite you to go look at another tutorial on how to download and install MongoDB. Very simple stuff could be done within minutes, okay? And in this tutorial, I've used the defaults, so there's not much to follow. Um, the other thing is, it's very developer friendly. If I later on want to, fig, you know, I want to add another attribute uh, to my log record, I don't have to modify schema. It's just, you know, easily just putting that new key in there with the value and MongoDB is going to take it. So the other thing is, is because that record is small enough to fit entirely in a document, in a Mongo document, I don't need the overhead of, um, let's say, transactions. It's more of an atomic write, and um, off to the races I go. So I got low overhead. The, also, additionally, I'm going to be using the asynchronous API to perform my writes, because in this kind of application, I don't really care to wait for my writes okay, to go through before continuing. So I'm going to have a high throughput there, and I'll use the synchronous API to read later on. Okay? So all those good points are a reason why I'm using MongoDB here. Why Spring Data? Well, this is not really a question, <laughs> right? If anyone has, uh, has used the Spring repositories, the Spring Data repositories, you'll know right away that you know, these are the highest level abstractions to, um, to interact with the database of choice, in this case, MongoDB. So that Mongo template that I'm going to be showing uh, has a lot of um, powerful, uh, it has a lot of power and flexibility in there that I'm going to be using. Um, and I'm going to go through those points uh, later on, okay? So without further ado, let's take a look at the demo. So the demo is one which I've used in other tutorials where, you know, I have a mission database here. I just click on a mission and I get its, um, I get its summary over here. And as I go through, you'll notice I have the last one here, boom mission, which actually doesn't exist. So it, it generates an internal uh, stack trace, which I'm going to be interested in filtering through later on. The meat here, the reason why we're all listening to me right now is because of that Mongo logger tab here, right? So this is obviously done in Java FX, but the concept that I'm going through can be used in any application or any, any you know, graphical user interface technology. So over here, I have four text fields that I can use to filter through my logs. I have a date picker for the uh, start time, end time, uh, sorry, the date, uh, start date, end date, and here the start time, end time. I got my logger levels. So right now it's set to info as default. If I do a search, you'll see that uh, over here, I'm basically going through my logs just on the log.infos that got logged in there. So as I go through, I got my timestamp, my message, the logger, an exception column, if ever there was an exception associated with that, and the actual thread that generated um, uh, 
that log message, okay? So right off the bat, visually, it's a lot more uh, appeasing. Uh, you see the record count, I got 233. I put the Mongo uh, query string actually in there for us to see, which is very nice. If I wanna go through all of them, right? You'll see here that there's almost 30,000 uh, records. So a heck of a lot of, a lot of stuff there. So if I want to go in there and say, I don't know, I want to, I want to filter through anything with the keyword Mongo in there, you'll see right now that I have, you know, about 4,465 records. I could even go in there and say, okay, show me from the 17th to the uh, 18th. Now I'm down to 1,439. So you see, if I don't put a time, Mongo is going to be using uh, the midnight UTC time here, okay, which is fine. I can go in here and say, well, in this case here, I want to be using uh, 1800. I could put the, uh, you know, some more, some more stuff in there, but I'm down to 157 over here. Now, again, you'll notice here it's 18, but over here it's UTC um, 00. So over here, I can also go 1800, uh, and I'll go about 30 here. And all of a sudden, I'm down. To, I'm up to 1,034 because now it's not UTC, um, you know, midnight anymore. So you get the point, right? I can filter with this, filter with this, and this, and sky's the limit here. So let me go back here and clear everything out, and um, you know, let's take a look at the errors. Yeah. All right. So all the errors here. So here are all the times I clicked on the boom mission in this case. Okay. You'll notice that the exception column is now populated, and I can actually click on it. I get the exception and I can actually click here and I got the stack trace. So this is you know, really invaluable information when you're actually looking for an issue. I can now you know, search for an exception uh, through a, a date and a time, a specific log. Uh, everything is here to query and it's very, very powerful. And you'd be surprised how um, you know doing this with Spring Data and MongoDB is really easy. The hardest part of building all of this was JavaFX, right? Which uh, <laughs> maybe I'll come up with another tutorial show you how I came up with this table and the, the cell factories and stuff like that. But but it really was the hardest part, and that's why it took me so long to come up with this uh, with this tutorial. Actually, was it, it, it slowed me down on that part. But everything else uh, really came out. Um, really nice so let's take a look at that other stuff the code right the stuff you're interested in so let me show you how to create a capped collection in, in mongodb okay so i already have my database up and running and what i'm going to do is i'm going to start i'm going to type in mongo here and that'll start my mongo shell and over here i i've, I've pre-written the commands for you so there's a couple of ways. You'd either have a collection that you've already created and you want to convert it to a cap collection. Second scenario is you haven't created your collection yet and as you're creating it, you want to make it a capped collection. Okay, so I'll cover those two scenarios. And this here is the command you're going to need to convert to capped. Okay, so let's say you've already, um, you already have a collection and that collection is called log, right? You'd have to say DB dot run command convert to capped log and then you put the size, the maximum size of your collection. Okay, so again, log is the name of the collection, okay? In my case here. So here, this is about, I believe it's 100 megs. So after 100 megs is reached, it'll wrap around. So you're mimicking the behavior of a rolling file appender. Again, totally dependent on your type of uh, application. Right. This is how you figure out if your collection is capped or not. So in the database, you specify the name of the collection. In my case, it's log and I want it's a Boolean function here. Is it capped or not? And let's see what it returns. True. So it is capped. I've already done this. And the third scenario would be if you're creating the um, collection for the first time, you're going to specify some key value attribute there to to make it a cap collection. So I create a collection call log and here's a key called cap I want to set that to true so it becomes a cap collection and now there's another key called size and I specify the size okay and that's it that's really all you have to do when you have a cap collection now there's a couple of other key attributes there uh, not necessarily um, anything I want to cover in this tutorial but if you go take a look at the MongoDB um, documentation it's all in there and it got some other really interesting ideas for the logging topic in general which, although I don't cover in this tutorial, I invite you to go check out, okay? 
So that's how you create a cap collection, which I've done already. Let's take a look at the logging configuration, right? So over here, I have uh, my logback um, XML file. So I'm using logback with the SL4J uh, implementation in there. So let's take a look at that, all right? Now, if we go all the way at the bottom, this shouldn't be uh, new to anybody that's, that's done logging in the past. There's my root logger. I put it to debug here. And again, I'm trying to generate a lot of um, log records for the tutorial here. Uh, this should not be of any surprise, standard output. Usually you see file here, right? And there's nothing wrong with logging to file, okay? I don't want to knock that. I just want to concentrate on, 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 on not doing that in this tutorial. So instead, I've come up with a custom appender called Mongo, okay? So let's go up here, and you'll see my custom appender Mongo. And I've come up with a, a, a class here called Mondo, Mongo Log Appender Async. Maybe I should have called it, you know, uh, ASIC Appender. But anyways, it's done. And I have my level set to debug because I want to generate lots of logs. And that's why we had something like 30,000 there. And my connection string, right? So this is going to call the method set connection string in this class over here that we'll see. And this is your run-of-the-mill default, you know, driver string here where this is the driver, MongoDB. Uh, the database is going to be run on local host on the default port number. That's what MongoDB uses as a default port number. Uh, out of the box, it ships, you know, with a database called test. So everything is as all the defaults are so far. The only thing I added was I created a collection, right, called log. So this is not like there's not a file called test.log. That's not how you read that. There's the database and that's the collection.log, okay? So by doing so here, now a log back is going to every time I do like a log dot info or a log dot whatever, right? Whenever you're logging in your application, it's going to generate an event and that event is going to be sent to my Mongo uh, logger over here. So let's take a look at that Mongo logger. Here are the imports. First thing to notice is that I'm using the async API in MongoDB. Now the async API mirrors the synchronous API. Okay, so in terms of you know the API, there's really no big ch no, no 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 big change. The thing is is that anytime there's a call that would cause the network to block, right? It takes as an additional argument something of type single result callback. So obviously it's a callback, and what it does is it's more like a functional um, interface. If we go take a look at it. All it really has is an on result um, method that you have to implement. So the T is the type, which is the return type. Now, in this case, it'll be void in this case, but uh, the other here is the throwable. So if ever there was an error that occurred, uh, then this would not be null, and then you would have to act on that, okay? So you'll be seeing things of type single result callback every time in the async API when you're calling a method that would traditionally cause it to block in its mirror API, which is the synchronous API, right? So obviously async doesn't block on anything. Anytime you call a method on the async API, it returns right away, okay? And when that operation does occur asynchronously, your single result callback gets executed, okay? So we'll take a look at that in a second. So here's my class. I'm extending the um, logback unsynchronized um, pender base. So I've opted for this because I don't want to be uh, bogged down with, you know, having to synchronize all this uh, and making it all sequential and everything because I want to do this asynchronously. Okay. And then anyhow, this is pretty much immutable state here as we're going to cover. I logging event is really that that log event that gets generated when you do a, let's say, log.info. Uh, and then you'll be able to take that event and extract information that the event holds, like the thread name or uh, the logger name or the exception or whatever, if there is one, and you can do whatever you want with it, okay? So there's a couple of methods to override here when you're coming up with your own um, appender. In this case, I'm extending this one. So I have to override the start method. And what I'm doing here is I'm using the factory class Mongo client. So it's got a couple of create methods that take in either a string or actually, let's take a look here. You'll see what I mean. You got create, so that connects by default to local host and the default port number. You got a couple of options here. You can go with a raw string, but I've wrapped the string up in a connection string over here, okay? You could, you could actually see it here. So this is what I was talking about here, uh, is, you know, this string gets passed to the set connection string method in my um, 
Mongo log appender. If we go down, you'll see it right over here. I might have just gone over it. There we go. Okay. So it gets passed over here and it gets encapsulated into my connection string. And it's basically mutable after that. I can pull a whole bunch of getters off it to get the information in that string. Now that string can be very complicated, especially when you're dealing with clusters and stuff like that. But for this case, it's super simple. Okay. So when I create my, um, when I call my create on that, it'll return to me a Mongo client. Okay. So a Mongo client is really a pool. Uh, and you can just save that as an instance variable and every time you use it, you'll get a connection to the database, okay? Now in this case here, it's kind of misleading because you, you think connections have been created and all that, but the connection and the database won't actually get created until it has to. So it's super fast returns and whenever it's gonna be, uh, you know, when you need to loop and maybe list something or do an operation on a collection, it'll then create the database or that collection as need be. So it's, um, it's very synchronous in, in that manner. Now, the only thing I do when I, um, you know, create that Mongo client is, although this is an asynchronous uh, API, I do want to wait for that initial, um, you know, database to be up and running before I continue with the application loading. So I'm not going to go through that code, but uh, you're free to take a look at the source code. I'm going to put a link in the description, and that just goes through basically synchronously uh, waiting for the database. Or, or, or a MongoD to be up and running before continuing to bootstrap the application because, you know, I wouldn't see the need to, um, you know, continue on with my application running if my logging wasn't set up because if I had a problem, then what, right? So that's the only part that's synchronous. After that, everything else is asynchronous. So I got the stop. Always make sure to close your Mongo client. Remember, it's a pool. Um, when this is closed, the meat of everything is the append. This is where the magic happens. So anytime you perform a log in your application, log dot, what a warning, log dot error, whatever, it doesn't matter, dot info, this guy uh, is going to get called because an iLogging event is going to get generated and passed to whatever appenders you've come up with, in this case, Mongo, right? So I want to make sure it's not null. And then I take that event and I want to convert it to a Mongo document. So I got to do some massaging here, right? So I have a method here called convert event into document for logging. And that's exactly what this one does, right? It takes the event, starts, uh, I don't know, I create my document, and I start extracting what I feel is important here, right? My logger name, my timestamp, my, all the stuff that you saw in the demo, right? All, this, all these fields over here, right? That's basically what, um, you know, all these columns rather, that's basically what I extract, right? And at the bottom here, I just want to, um, go get the stack trace and uh, the exception. And if the exception has a stack trace, well, I need to massage that too, right? So you'll notice that I have a um, add throwable to log, which is just some basic run of the mill Java code to extract, massage that, and then put the exception in that uh, Mongo document that gets passed in as an argument, okay? Don't forget, a Mongo document is nothing more than, you know, we'll simplify a key value store, okay? So I'm putting the key exception and I'm putting the stack trace. Uh, sorry, I put, well, stack trace dot get zero in this case here, that's the name of the variable, right? And if it's greater than one, because the list, uh, you know, you wouldn't just have an exception name, you would have multiple entries, then I save that under the key stack trace. So this is why I was able to, when I clicked on the view button, right? When I clicked on the view button, this is just the exception. And over here, I was able to get the list of all the rest over here. So that's actually being uh, put over here, okay? So once I've massaged that, I come back to this call, I return my log document and have it up here. And now I can use my client to get the database name. I can then get the collection. Once I got the collection, that's pretty much game over. I can insert whatever I want in there. So I insert one, what? Well, I insert a log. That's the log that I converted to uh, from ENV, from iLogging events to the document log I put in here. Now this was the synchronous API, that would, all, that would be all you need. But because this is the asynchronous API, again, I have that additional argument, the single result callback. Now I could have just put it in there as, a, as either an anonymous class or a Lambda expression, 
But for me, I like to actually encapsulate them in methods, right? Local methods, uh, they're a little bit more self-descriptive and it makes my methods, you know, m I find more cohesive. Like you can, you can see more what's going on. There's less, you know, curly braces. It, it's less busy. That's just my preference. So I'm gonna call, this is the callback when finished, the insert. So let's go take a look at that, right? Same file. Uh, so if my callback uh, it gets called, you'll see here that again, I have my result and my throwable. All I'm really interested in is making sure that the throwable is not null, right? That means, you know, that something went wrong if it's not null. So if that's the case, then I'm gonna be using logbacks uh, add warn method that I've inherited to, to, to basically say, hey, I, I wasn't able to log this message, okay? But in this case, I'm not too concerned about missing a, missing a log message. So that is basically uh, how you asynchronously uh, go off and log in um, log back with using uh, the asynchronous Mongo uh, DB API. So the bulk of the work again is in massaging the uh, I logging event to the document. Everything else pretty simple and standard. So the last piece of the puzzle is really uh, the controller, right? So in the application, when you click on uh, search, that obviously has an FXML um, you know, callback that gets executed and goes off and retrieves information, and displays it, right? So that's basically this guy here, the Mongo logger uh, controller. And again, the project itself is pretty, pretty small, right? Uh, the main pieces of this project are actually been already put up here, right? So there's only really four, four, well, three big pieces over here. So mostly JavaFX stuff, right? So again, I'm not going to go through the JavaFX stuff because that would be another tutorial and it takes away from what I'm trying to show you guys, okay? But here you'll see I have a Mongo template. So the Mongo template comes from Spring, okay? And in this case, I injected it into the constructor, okay? So using just auto wired. So Mongo, uh, so Spring Data rather, uh, or Spring Boot in this case that has Spring Data, um, is going to automatically auto wire this for me using convention over configuration. It basically is using the internal defaults like local host and that default port number in the default test database to be able to communicate with the uh, MongoDB. Now, I haven't had to configure anything actually because I'm using the internal defaults, but let's say I wasn't, right? Then what would you, I actually put here in a configuration file, Mongo config, what you would have to do. So I don't need this file, okay? I could actually delete this file and, and it would just work as is, but I wanted to show you guys anyhow. So this is a Java config class in Spring. You'll notice here's the Mongo template, right? So when I want to dependency inject it, it would come here, create my Mongo template, and I will call another Spring Bean called MongoDB Factory, which is this guy over here. Notice that I'm creating that Mongo client with local host and the default port number, and I'm using a simple MongoDB Factory to, to return that factory that's needed by the template, okay? So, and again, I'm using the test, the default test database. So these are all, you know, built-in defaults that I don't need to specify. So Spring Boot does this for me. But let's say you really needed to do something custom, right? Which is obviously going to be the case, right? This is just a tutorial. Then I suggest you take this template here that I came up with and you just modify it as you as you need, okay? Or you use some Spring Boot uh, properties in a properties file to, to, to get away with most of the stuff. But if you need to write some, some Taylor code, some custom code, then you go in here and you do that. But like I said, I could delete this file and it would just work, okay? So going back to the controller here, once I got my Mongo template, I'm in business. So what does a Mongo template do for us? Well, it does a lot of the things that you're used to in, um, and the other repositories, right? Not only is it your highest level abstraction to the database, okay, but it provides that mapping, those mappings that go from your Java domain objects to your MongoDB object, right? Think of that as, as a certain type of, uh, it's not object relational mapping as you would have in Hibernate, but the concept is the same, right? So for example, if we go back to the project view here, you'll notice I have a log record. Here's my Java class, right? It has my level, my logger, my thread, all the stuff that, that I'm interested in in a log, but it also has a Mongo ID that's specific to uh, storing this in um, a MongoDB collection, right? So this whole thing here is actually an at document. So if you take a look at the imports here, again, from Spring Framework, 
underneath the umbrella of, of MongoDB. So this is actually going to eventually get mapped to a Mongo document and back to a log record when you're searching and the template will facilitate that. And this is my ID, much like any other at ID in all the other persistence frameworks, okay? Now, if my instance variable level, I didn't want it to be exactly mapped to the key in the collection level, then I could do a little annotation at field to override that. I'm using the convention over configuration to facilitate all this, okay? But all the annotations are there to override those. The rest is just setters and getters. That's all it is, okay? So you see how easy this is? This is basically all strings, list of string for the stack trace, obviously, and a date for the timestamp. So um, it really it really couldn't be easier to, to start mapping this back and forth to MongoDB. So the template is going to facilitate that. The other thing that I'm going to make heavy use of in this uh, tutorial is the advanced query and criteria API that they have. Okay, you're going to see it's super easy to do those advanced queries, and it it's very fluent. The API is fluent. It reads well. It's, it's you know, and I didn't really have to write any complex code to get things up and running. And the other thing is is that we're you know we're very used to having exception translation in our Spring repositories, right? Anytime in Mongo. Uh, exception is going to get thrown, it'll be properly converted to a spring data exception hierarchy. So that's just your regular run of the mill uh, spring data repository stuff. But it's stuff that we kind of taking for granted these days, right? So they're pretty consistent in that. So obviously, the template also has all those CRUD operations that we're used to having. And uh, I'm going to just be making use of the, um, the find in this case because I've already created the record using the asynchronous API, right? Write once, read many, right? That's where Mongo strives. So I'm gonna be reading many times with this template. Now. So here's the uh, callback that, um, that gets called when you click on the search button, okay? So I clear the table view and then I build my query. So again, query here, if we go take a look at the, um, the imports, comes from Spring Framework for MongoDB. So, like I said, we got an advanced query and uh, criteria API here. So let's start using it. So here we go. I have these, this method called get user criteria from text field. Now what, this is just a method. Uh, I got four of them, as you can see that I'm calling one, two, three, four, because I have in my tutorial here, in my demo, one, two, three, four text boxes, right? So I'm gonna have to pass the instance variable of that text field, right? And uh, this method over here just simply checks if uh, that field is present or not, right? If you've entered something or not. And if so, uh, we don't want to check if it's null and all that kind of stuff. So I've used an optional. So if that optional has a value, if it's present, then take that search string that the user um, provided, right? And add it as a criteria to the query. So I've created an empty query because I have to add the criteria dynamically, right? These are dynamic queries. So I add a criteria to the query and I say the criteria where the message, so this is the key in the log collection, right? Would match the regular expression as you put in your search, right? So this is a regular expression search. I haven't been using regular uh, expressions. I've just been using, you know, normal text. And the I here is for case and sensitivity. I didn't even pronounce that right. I don't care. Okay. So it's case insensitive. And uh, obviously you can come up with a little checkbox there and you, you, you can make, you know, you can take this tutorial and make it what you want, right? This is just me giving you a proof of concept that works. Sky's the limit afterwards. So I do the same thing. Uh, it's the same exact code for the logger, the thread, and the exception. Okay, and you notice this is kind of just dynamically adding. It's like saying and this, and this, and this, but only if it's there, right? Because it's the optional that's going to determine if there's something in there or not. So it's very flexible. I do the same thing. This one's a little bit different. I couldn't reuse that that method because it's a drop down box, right? It's a combo box rather. So, but I still say hey, where the level is equal to the log search level that the user uh, selected. And what's really uh, a little bit different is uh, the date, right? I have the date picker for the start, the start date, the date picker for the end date, and then I have my, my times in there as well, right? So I still go through, um, you know, an optional for that. Um, and I'm not going to show you those private methods, right? Because if not, the tutorial is going to be like an hour and a half long. So again, check out the source code if you want. But I'm basically using Java 8's local date time 
Uh, and once I get uh, any information that the user entered, I use again the criteria and say where the, the timestamp, which is the key in the collection, is greater than or equal to whatever time I, I specified for the start time. And if the end time was entered, well, then I just take that, that criteria again, which I have as a, a local variable here, and then I say less than. So I have the, the greater than and equal over here and the less than for that time range. Just those couple lines of file replace, I don't know how many lines of files you'd have to write in a shell script, right? Lots and lots. So once I'm done doing all that, I add uh, that, that, that criteria to the query. And you know, by this time, you, you have your query. The, and you just return it. The nice thing is, is if, um, if, if, if kind of things go wrong, um, you know, MongoDB will always return everything as a query, okay? So you, you, you'll notice that if you're kind of playing around with MongoDB, you're like, hey, I didn't, I didn't specify anything and, and the whole thing got returned to me. That's the way it works, okay? So if you don't specify anything specifically, the whole thing uh, gets returned to you. So now that I've got my query, I built my query, get that return, I pass this to a local method called find all with criteria and I pass in my query string. So let's go take a look at that guy, right? Very simply, I use my template. Notice I haven't really used my template directly yet, right? I use my template, I do a find, I pass in the query to it. So here's my query that I built using the querying criteria API. Here's my log record class. You're going to have to do the mapping, right, between the the db object in the mongo world to the java type right in this case in this case log record back and forth okay so it's got already that that that, that mapping facility there and here's the name of the collection so it goes off finds that and returns to you a list of records i write out that that query to the label right and that's just this guy here for us to see this this query string over here i find that pretty cool to look at while this is going especially as you're developing it and you just loop through all the records and the log records specifically and you add them to the table view and that's it and that's how it works okay so again the hardest part really is, is setting this up in, in java fx right setting up the table and the, and the columns and stuff like that to make it look nice uh, but the code itself is not complicated so there you have it guys i hope you now have maybe some new ideas in your toolbox on how to um, implement some advanced Java logging in your uh, next application. I sure had fun putting this together for you guys. Just took a little bit longer than I would have liked. But that's it for me. Thanks a lot for watching. And don't forget to subscribe uh, to be notified for the next one. Ciao.